Okay, good morning to all of you. <coughs> uh, since I was told that I am being live streamed, I will use English for my medium today, if you do not mind. But I remember that the last time I addressed this subject, that was six years ago in a theological forum in Grace Ministerial Academy, I had answers and criticisms coming from America and Canada, so I don't mind the infamy. <laughs> but we will be addressing this subject, and I hope we just focus our minds on the subject and not think about any controversy we are embroiled at the present and only think whether this is what our confession is teaching and more than that, whether it is what the scriptures are teaching. That is my interest, that is my real concern, and what I want to see and what I want to show is that there's this present controversy that is boiling in many uh, areas of re the Reformed Baptist community is because of a misreading of the 1689 Confession. And I want to guide us all through this misreading and then a rereading, which means we go back to the 1689 and let us look at the words themselves and more than that again, try to ground all this in the scriptures. So, yun ang gusto natin gawin na ang ating pin, pin, pinaninindigan na 1689 Confession, yun ba talaga ang itinuturo? At higit doon ay yun ba ang itinuturo ng salita ng Diyos? So, we will begin with this titled Covenant, Misread and Reread, and we are looking at how it is taught in the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. Let me begin with a key text in Ephesians 2 and verse 12, where Apostle Paul is describing the Gentiles in their former lives before they became believers in Jesus Christ. What was their status? There is a description here that is very relevant to our subject, and one that uh, I believe gives a very clear understanding of how the New Testament, in this case the Apostle Paul, understood the past covenants. In Ephesians 2.12, he says, Remember, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Now, you can look at these lines as parallel to each other. One line is saying the same thing of the next line, but in a different or from a different angle. Those who are outside of Christ, which the Gentiles were in their unconverted lives, they were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. So there is something about Israel that was not true of the Gentiles, and we know what that was in the Old Testament. The Israel was the covenant nation that Gentile nations were not. But take note here what it says in the third line, strangers to the covenants of promise. So it uses the plural, and it uses what we call in... Uh, exegesis, a genitive, that is the construction noun of blank noun, and the second noun here is meant to describe the covenants. So they are plural, which refers to several covenants in the Old Testament, and they are all covenants of promise. So promise is the characteristic of all the covenants from the Old Testament until now in the New Testament. And because they were outside the covenants of promise in the Old Testament, they have no hope, they have no God in this world. And that means that it is only because they have come to Christ in the New Covenant that they are now part of the children of God, part of the covenant people of God. So this is a, a very important text to make us understand whatever we say of the past covenants, the Apostle Paul looked at them as covenants of promise. Now you will see why I'm making a very strong emphasis on this. So we are looking first at covenant. Ano ba itong covenant? Why are we emphasizing covenant? Covenant, you see, is a distinctive reading 
of uh, Reformed theology of the scriptures in contrast with dispensationalism. Covenant reading of redemptive history is distinct from dispensationalism, which is the popular way of understanding scriptures today. Now, both dispensationalists and Reformed theologians believe in redemptive history, meaning redemption did not come as a lump sum uh, to Adam or to anyone in the Old Testament. It progressed. That's why there is a history of development, except that in the case of dispensationalism, their idea of progress is by changes of dispensations. So there is the dispensation of innocence that failed. They then go to other dispensations. And for the dispensationalists, the most important dispensation divisions are dispensation of law on the one hand in the Old Testament and then dispensation of grace in the New Testament that will be followed by the dispensation of the millennium, etc. A key thought what dispensationalists, dispensationalists are doing in establishing their position is their division of God's plan for Israel and the church. They are saying that God has a plan for Israel. You read that in the Old Testament, and that plan has not yet been fulfilled. It is suspended because the Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah, and therefore the plan that God has set for Israel is now in suspension. God has shifted to the church, as it were, in order to uh, develop or to fulfill His redemptive grace. So God's plan now shifted to the church. Israel is still the people of God, but in suspension because they are under God's judgment for rejecting Jesus. But one day, it is going to be resumed. It is going to be resumed when what they call the rapture comes, God will take or Jesus will take all Christians from the world, and what will remain will be Israel and all unbelievers, all Gentile nations. He will then resume what his original plan was for Israel, beginning with the rapture. Kaya ang mangyayari ay tribulation period, the Antichrist, suffering of the Jews, but the Jews will be converted, and then millennium, etc. Now, this is not our main subject, and I am just uh, emphasizing the distinction of covenant appreciation of redemptive history. We must understand, as we read the Old Testament in particular, that the way to read that is to see what covenant is in place in a particular period of history, rather than, in the case of dispensationalism, they are thinking of dispensations, meaning how God changes in His dealings with man because of man's failure. Our chief answer or key answer to dispensationalism, and I'm not going to develop it, just simply emphasize it that God's plan for Israel in the Reformed perspective is now fulfilled and being fulfilled and in fact expanded in the New Testament church. So what God has promised to Israel in the Old Testament has not failed. It has not been suspended. Rather, it is being fulfilled, but now in the church. Now, one charge that you will hear from some dispensationalists, and I will not name names, but uh, one charge that you will often hear is you are resorting to replacement theology. Uh, and by that they mean you are replacing what God has promised that should be fulfilled with Israel, and now you're saying it's being fulfilled in the, in the church. That is not replacement. It is expansion. If I, just to use an illustration, if I make a replacement, I replace this with this, I'll discard this and then use this. But what we are holding is not replacement but expansion, which means we keep this and we also add this. So nothing is displaced. The church today is composed of Jews and Gentiles who are all believers 
in Christ and whatever God promised to Israel in the Old Testament in spiritual terms and in redemptive terms, they are now being fulfilled in the church. And that is why in Galatians 6.16, Apostle Paul calls the church the Israel of God. So, so much for dispensationalism that is not our subject for today. But why the covenant? We need to understand why God is dealing with us in covenant terms. Redemptive history is through the progress of the covenant of grace, but why the covenant? Covenant is on top of creation. Remember, you and I are God's creatures, and as His creatures, He has His rights over us. And we have obligations to Him. Regardless of anything that we can gain from obeying Him, regardless of anything that we may uh, enjoy in obeying God, it is our obligation. Covenant is on top of creation. In covenant, God simply does not impose His obligations on His creatures. He is making a pledge relationship. He is saying, if you obey me, which is already your obligation, regardless of anything I give back, that's not a consideration in a creator-creature relationship. But by making a covenant with you, I am also pledging myself. If you obey me, I am going to grant you favor. And that is the reality of the covenant, which makes it an even more amazing reality of God's relationship with us. He did not simply stop at being creator and creatures we are who have an obligation to obey Him. God made a covenant that if we actually obey Him, there will be favors that He would pledge. So that's what makes a covenant on top of creation. Now, the first of these covenants is the covenant of works. Now, you will not read that in your concordance, so uh, don't try to look at the expression in the Bible itself. It is a theological category. It is a theological language. In the covenant of works, it is a covenant that God made with Adam before the fall, meaning Adam was still in his righteous condition, in his innocent status, holy, and therefore, as federal head, he represented all mankind in the most favorable condition possible. Uh, there are those who will reject the idea of representation, but are you going to make a better job with all the sins and all the negative uh, conditions we now have Whereas Adam was in a perfect condition and he himself was without sin, he was righteous, and it was right for God to appoint him as federal head. A covenant of works was in play when God put Adam in the Garden of Eden. And in this covenant of works, if Adam passed, the probation, whatever time, we do not know and we, we are not told. But there must be a time in which Adam was put under probation to obey God with that particular test of not eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If he passed that test, he and all that he represented, mankind, he and mankind would be eternally righteous. Now, let me be clear. That is not salvation by grace. That is earned merit because he is not, sinless, he is not sinful. I have heard uh, those who are on the other side saying it's still grace with Adam when God gives him favor if he has fulfilled the covenant of works because he does not deserve it. Wrong. He would have deserved it because he was sinless and he would have earned whatever the covenant of works has imposed on him. So that is the fact. Adam was under probation. 
he represented mankind, whatever he did within that probation would be imputed to all mankind. If he had been righteous, that righteousness would have been imputed to all mankind. There would be no sin, but all those are only academic and moot discussion because the fact is Adam sinned. Adam fell. Adam fell into sin, and the result is that his sin is imputed to all mankind. So yung kanyang kasalanan ay ibinilang na kasalanan ng lahat ng sangkatauhan. E yan ang maliwanag na itinuturo ng Romans 5.12 by one man, sin entered into the world, and by that all sinned. Now notice that what precedes our sinning is that we already have the imputed sin of Adam. In other words, we already are constituted sinners by virtue of Adam's fall. And because we are sinners, in fact, from our mother's womb, that's what the Bible teaches, that's why we sin. You do not become a sinner at your first sin. You sin because you're already a sinner, and you're a sinner because of Adam's standing as federal head. So that is the facts of the covenant of works. Now, in this redemptive history, which is through the progress of the covenant of grace, we have then something to take the place of the covenant of works, and this is called the covenant of grace. There is a need for another federal head. And from eternity, God has appointed the Son, which would in His incarnation be the Lord Jesus Christ, God appointed the Son of God to be that next Adam, who is called the last Adam, because He will take the place of Adam where the original Adam fell from. Jesus Christ will take the place of Adam in living under the covenant of works so that whatever he does will be imputed to all he represented but by way of a covenant of grace. So in the case of Christ, there is still a covenant of works. There is still the probation that he must obey without fail all that God has commanded him. So in that status, he is the federal head of his people. Whatever he does, he will do in representation of his people, not just for himself, but for the people he represented. And in that way, he is still under covenant of works. But Christ, in contrast with Adam, perfectly obeyed the terms of the covenant of works. Where Adam failed, Jesus succeeded. You know, when you read that temptation account, uh, many times we think of a model reading. Oh, this is Jesus how overcame temptation by the devil. So let us learn from him how to overcome our own temptations. Now, there is that. I do not deny it. But the more important reading of the temptation account is as Adam was tempted and fell, Jesus also took the position of being tempted and won the victory. He was righteous. And that's only a piece of the whole account of Jesus' life which was full of temptations because Hebrews 4.15 tells us he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. So ganyan ang naging kalagay ng Panginoon. Uh, kinatawan niya ang lahat niyang mga tao upang sa kanyang tagumpay sa covenant of works sa kasalanan, ang kanyang mga kinatawan ay kabilangan din ng kanyang katuwiran. So remember what happened to Adam? Adam fell and his sin was imputed to all mankind. That explains why we are all sinners. But in the case of Christ, because he 
was righteous, he obeyed, he succeeded where Adam failed in the covenant of works, Christ's righteousness is now imputed to his people as a covenant of grace. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, He who knew no sin, that's his victory over the uh, temptations and sins uh, that he went through, and he succeeded. He who knew no sin, and yet what happened? He became sin for us, that through his righteousness, we might become righteous in Him. So the righteousness of Christ is now imputed to those who will become believers in Jesus Christ. So your righteousness is not your own. Whatever righteous works you do are but fruit of what was imputed to you. We call it justification by faith. Imputed righteousness is part of and the initial blessing of that covenant of grace. Now, let us look at the misreading of this position by dear brethren among the Reformed Baptist community, which they call 1689 Federalism. I would have had no problem if they just call it Federalism, and we all believe in Federalism of one kind, my problem is they are calling it 1689. And that, I believe, is sequestering something that does not belong to their position. In their position, the key is this. For the Federalist, 1689 Federalist, the covenant of grace is identified only with a new covenant in Christ. Remember our main text, Ephesians 2.12, where Paul says, you were strangers to the covenants of promise. He was referring to the Old Testament covenants, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Moses, the covenant with David. All those covenants are covenants of promise. And because the Gentiles were not believers, they were strangers to those covenants. Now, the 1689 Federalists are saying that the covenant of grace is only the new covenant, which means the New Testament in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the key to their position. This is in contrast with the classical reading of the confession of faith that this covenant of grace is from Adam to Christ. Now, it cannot be both true. One is saying the covenant of grace is from Adam. When Adam fell, the covenant of grace began to unfold until fulfilled in Christ. The 1689 Federalists are saying, no, the covenant of grace is only when Christ was incarnate and then fulfilled the uh, types and promises of the old covenant. He died and rose again. That's the covenant of grace, not anything before that. And one of the reasons why they adopt this position, they believe, is that it is the best answer to pedobaptism meaning this at last is unanswerable as far as pedobaptists are concerned. Pedobaptists, for those who are new, refer to those who baptize infants. They baptize infants because they believe that the children of believers belong to the covenant the way it was in the old covenant where Jews can circumcise their male children because they belong to the covenant. So they say there must be a parallel in the new covenant. Uh, baptism, which is the sign of the covenant, should also be administered to their children. Now, if you can prove that the covenant of grace is only the new covenant and not in the old covenant, uh, the 1689 Federalists think that they have an, an answer to that pedobaptist argument. Now, let me just answer this first again by 
explaining how would they account for the covenants of the past before the new covenant. Their teaching is that past covenants are republication of the covenant of works. Now we can go very deep theologically here. I will not do that. I will try to simplify. So they are saying, remember the covenant of works with Adam. If you do this, you are going to be righteous forever. You will live. So the principle do and live becomes the slogan of the covenant of works. And they maintain that the past covenants, mainly the Mosaic covenant, must be a covenant of works of sorts uh, by way of republication because there are demands, uh, the, these covenants demand works for life, particularly the Mosaic covenant demands works for life. Uh, and they love to use here Levitic, Leviticus 18 verse 5 that says, if you do, you will live. But they fail to read it in its context, Leviticus 18.5 is preceded by Leviticus 18 verse 2, which says, I am the Lord your God. So there's already a relationship in the context of that works demand. And that works demand does not necessarily mean it is like the covenant of works that demands works in order to be righteous forever, but rather because God already established a relationship with them graciously, then they have this duty and they are bound to do works according to the law. They also forget that the law that is established in Leviticus includes the ceremonial law. And what is the significance of the ceremonial law? The significance of the ceremonial law, particularly the sacrifices, is it is the type of what Christ has done on the cross. Through, through sacrifices, whatever the sins of the people of Israel may have been, they were ceremonially atoned for. In other words, there was a provision for atonement. It was not expected that these people were going to obey all the laws perfectly. That is why even the law of Moses provides for sacrifices so that those who God knows will be unable to perfectly obey the law still have atonement for their sins. And those who read Leviticus 18.5 make the, the position that it must be a covenant of works of sorts, a, uh, a republication of the covenant of works, are, they are wresting it from the context. And when Apostle Paul, in fact, uses Leviticus 18.5 in two passages in the New Testament, one in Romans 10.5 following, and Galatians 3.10 following, you can study that later. What he is doing is indicting the legalism of the Jews, the Judaizers. Uh, what he is saying is, you are thinking that you can obey the law and find justification from obedience to the law, and in so doing, you are resting from the context what Leviticus 18.5 is saying. You see here the danger always of reading a text and then isolating it from its context, making conclusions without the context, both of the original citation in the Old Testament and the way the Apostle Paul uses it in the New Testament he is not saying that justification is by works of the law. And he is not saying that it was the case in the Mosaic Covenant that justification was by the works of the law. That would be totally contradicting himself in many passages of his own letters, Galatians 2.16. We know that by the works of the law, no flesh shall 
can be justified. Paul will not contradict himself. What he is indicting is the legalism of the Judaizers who use this text, who use the law as the way of justification. And Paul is telling them, if you use that, then this is what the law really requires. And what that requirement tells you is you cannot. It's just like when Jesus told the rich young ruler who came to him, how shall I inherit eternal life? What did Jesus tell him? Obey the commandments. Did, was Jesus telling him a new way of salvation, that salvation can be earned by obedience to the commandments? No, he is using here what the reformers call the first use of the law. The first use of the law is to bring you to conviction, to a sense of helplessness. It is not saying that you can actually obey the law and earn justification. He is rather bringing to him a sense of helplessness. But instead of that, the rich young ruler even dug deeper and said, all the commandments I have obeyed from my youth. And Jesus has to use at least one commandment that he cannot even uh, face up to as something that he has done. The commandment 10, you shall not covet. Uh, the point is, the 1689 Federalists are using Leviticus 18.5, which has its context in the covenant relationship already established with Israel, which was by grace, and then use it as a justification for their position that the Mosaic Covenant must be covenant of works. It is not. This is the same way in the giving of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, before the first commandment was even given, the preamble of the Ten Commandments is God saying, I redeemed you from slavery to Egypt. Now, these are my commandments. Which is only showing that there is a place for doing good works in the covenant of grace. It is a misconception. It is a total misunderstanding for anyone to say that because there is a demand for works, it must be covenant of works. No, not at all. Demand for works as fruit of grace is consistent with the new covenant and with the covenant of grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we are all familiar with that. Uh, for by grace we have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But many times we put a stop on that when verse 10 should immediately follow, we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, created for good works. So there is a place for good works, even in the covenant of grace, even in the new covenant, without it becoming covenant of works. Because we are to produce works out of grace. So that is the misunderstanding, again, in simplified terms, of the 1689 federalism. Now, how do we answer pedobaptism? Because they say this is the most effective answer. Uh, because the covenant of grace we can show is only for believers. Uh, and what they mean by that is the new covenant is only for believers. And they are extending it to all aspects of the covenant of grace. But our answer of the, is that the covenant of grace as Old Testament and New Testament is sufficient answer to pedobaptism. We do not need to make the covenant of grace only the new covenant to answer infant baptism. Why is that? Because there is progress. The progress is from promise. Remember, they were covenants of promise. But when it comes to Christ, what is distinctive of the new covenant and what makes it glorious is that it is fulfillment. So it is promise to fulfillment. And how does that parallel to 
that issue on baptism, it parallels that the period of promise is generation-based. You are part of the covenant community by belonging to the generation of Israel. That's the Old Testament. That's why those who are uh, children of the Israelites were circumcised uh, because of their generation. But when we come to the new covenant, the ground of belonging to the covenant community is no longer generation, but regeneration. That's the progress. John 1.11, regarding the Israelites, John says, He came, the Lord Jesus came to His own, and His own did not receive Him. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to be called children of God, even to those who believe in His name. And then verse 13 says, Who were born, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Well, you see the change now that John is teaching in this prologue. Before, it was by generation of flesh. But since Christ, it is now regeneration. You must be born again, not as a command, but rather as an initiative of God regenerating the soul so that he may become the child of God. So there is an answer. There is a sufficient answer to pedobaptism without resorting to the idea of 1689 federalism. And then uh, let us go to the 1689 confession. You have in your handout the 1689 Baptist confession. Just read the first part of paragraph 3. This covenant, and it is referring to the covenant of grace clearly from paragraph 2. Paragraph 3, this covenant is revealed in the gospel first of all to Adam in the promise of salvation by the seed of the woman and afterwards by farther steps until the full discovery thereof was completed in the New Testament. So let us look at what this is saying and digest and dissect them. First, it is speaking of a beginning. The, oh, the teaching that we can draw from this is that the covenant of grace progressed from Adam until fulfillment in Christ. One covenant of grace maintains one storyline of redemption from the Old Testament to the New Testament. That's what we are after. That's what we are trying to maintain. There's one covenant storyline. There are many subplots, but there is one storyline from Genesis to Revelation. And that is one storyline of redemption. And you can only maintain that by establishing that there is that one covenant of grace that began with Adam, developing until fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So, uh, what is the significance of this? Well, one important significant point is that if there is one covenant of grace, it renders preaching of the gospel valid and imperative in the Old Testament. May ibanghelyo kang maipapangaral sa lumang tipan kung merong covenant of grace. You see, that is one of the reasons why if you read the literature of the 1689 Federalists, they are always forced to say that the covenant of grace is in one sense present in the Old Testament. They cannot totally deny it. And so they always have to say those words in one sense or in some sense. And you need to pursue that argument in what sense? Because they cannot maintain after propounding the idea that the covenant of grace is only the new covenant, they cannot maintain it because they have to preach the gospel from the Old Testament. And so somehow the covenant of grace is there. 
and they can only say in some sense. James Renihan, you read all these proponents of the 1689 federalism, and they all say that in some sense, which is really, I will be inconsistent preaching the gospel from the Old Testament unless I can say the covenant of grace is there in some sense. How much easier it is to say that the covenants in the Old Testament are covenant of grace. It has a beginning, and our confession of faith is clear. When did it begin? First of all, to Adam. Those are the words of our confession. So from the beginning of sin, there is already a provision of grace. That is why you have the proto-evangelium of Genesis 3.15 that tells uh, God telling the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. And you see there what uh, from the very beginning Christians have understood as the first gospel, proto-evangelium. Because from the beginning of sin, grace is provided. Not only the beginning, it also tells us the unfolding, how it developed. It says, afterwards, by farther steps. It's in the confession. And I'm a simple man reading this confession with a simple mind. And I can only understand it to say that what began as covenant of grace with Adam is now continuing in all of the Old Testament history, unfolding by farther steps that is progressing. There is progressive revelation of the covenant of grace in the various covenants of the Old Testament, from Abraham to Moses to David. They are all covenants of grace, covenants of promise. So they were in a promissory status, but the fulfilling belongs to the new covenant in Christ. So until the full discovery thereof, that's the language of our covenant. Christ fulfills covenant promises that's why you and I are much more advantaged because what we have is fulfillment. What those before Christ had were promises. As possessors of promises, they are the advantage over those who, do, who, do, who did not have the promise at all. But for those of us who possess the reality, we have the advantage over those who only have the promises. And that is what the beauty and the glory of the new covenant is all about. So one covenant of grace makes the fulfillment of Christ more glorious. So they think they are the ones making the new covenant glorious by making it Oh, the only covenant of grace. What we are saying is by looking at the covenant of grace as that progressing treatment by God with His people from the moment of sin, going through the history of Israel in their moments of obedience and apostasies, and in all of this, Grace continues to develop until fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That makes it all the more glorious. And therefore, from this, I want to make this final thought from Hebrews 8, verse 13, how we think of the new covenant. In speaking of a new covenant, the writer says, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So he is not disregarding the old covenant. He is saying it has made its function done. Its function is done. We now have the new covenant. So we now give glory to the new covenant 
the old covenant is no more, it's no longer operative. What is operative is the new covenant that we have in Christ and the response should be we glory in the covenant faithfulness of God. But you can only talk of the faithfulness of God if you bring it back to the very beginning. It has been God dealing with us in grace, developing in further covenants until the last and the fulfillment, which is the new covenant in Jesus Christ. So my beef with 1689 federalism they have the right and the liberty, and I respect their position on the covenant in terms of their federalism. But I dispute their use of 1689 as the ground of it. My challenge is read the 1689. Read chapter 7, and it's all there. You cannot mistake it by simply reading it. The covenant of grace is from the beginning of sin until fulfillment in Jesus Christ. That's why you can read the all of the scriptures with that, uh, with that uh, funnel of interpretation that reveals the grace of God ever-growing, ever-resplendent until its final fulfillment in Jesus Christ. I'm ready for objections and <laughs> debut. So, yung claim po nung 1689 federalist, yung mga federalist ay 1689 din sila. So, bali po, ang question ko, ma kailan kaya sila nag-umpisang i-embed nyo sarili nila as federalist? Kailan nag-umpisa bali yung view na yan na, na federalist sa 1689? A document by Nehemiah Cox <clears throat> was discovered I'm not sure of the date, but it was published in 2022, uh, Vindication of Truth. And according to them, Maya Cox, who was a draftee of the uh, 1677 <coughs> original, from on which was based the 1689 Confession. So he was a draftee. Uh, there were a few of them. Uh, and according to them, the Nehemiah Cox has taken the position uh, that they are now taking. But I'll tell you what. The idea of republication of covenant of works is not Nehemiah Cox. It is Meredith Klein, a contemporary theologian of the Westminster Theological Seminary who has originated this in modern times and many followed both pedo baptists and Baptist who followed the Republication theory. So as much as they say it was Nehemiah Cox, you see there, if you are well-read in theology, you know that they have drawn from Meredith Klein, who was a professor of the Westminster Theological Seminary. And among Reformed Baptists, it was the uh, it was James Renihan and his uh, fellows, uh, Robert Gonzalez and others, who have promoted this position, and many have followed them. And I, I dare to challenge those who follow them, read the 1689 Confession. Read it, in fact, you can read it in comparison with the Westminster Confession, the, 60, the Savoy Declaration, and you will find that the 1689 is much shorter. It removed, it deleted things that were written in the Covenant chapter of the Westminster and the Savoy. They made it only three paragraphs 
in the 1689, but in those three paragraphs, they have simplified it so much that you cannot mistake them saying that the covenant of grace began first with Adam, then uh, further. It says, afterwards, by further steps until full discovery. Uh, you have that language. How else can you read it than that the covenant of grace was there in Adam? Other questions? Objections? or Yes, sir. Uh, one, two. Hello. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning. Uh, uh, ang question ko lang, Pastor, yung, yung uh, as we all know, that all the servants of God in the Old Testament are mga prominent in tao, mga matataas. May hari, mayroong mga pariseo, no, araw, matataas sila, Pastor. Sa, sa New Testament, parang may, may napapansin na kung mababa ang uri ng mga pagkatao nila. So, Ang, ang question ko, directly to the point, Pastor, uh, yung sinasabi ni Apostol Pablo na inilihim niya yun sa Old Testament. Nahayag ngayon, na-reveal ngayon dito sa New Testament. Yung wisdom o hiwaga, mystery. What is that related? Is it related to uh, covenant of grace? Thank you, Pastor. Well, una, yung sa observation mo na mas matataas na tao ang mga hinirang ng Diyos sa lumang tipan kaysa sa bagong tipan ay it's not hindi ito tamang observasyon dahil ang pinili niya isang bansa at sa isang bansa may mga namumuno may mas maraming mga tagasunod kaya ang pinili niya isang buong bansa hindi sa pangkaligtasan kundi pangkasangkapan tungo sa pagtupad ng kaligtasan Pagdating sa bagong tipan, ito ay pangkalahatan na. Uh, ang sinabi sa Galatians 3.28, no free, no slave. Uh, wala, hindi na, hindi na magiging factor ang antas sa lipunan. So, wala na yon. Tungkol sa hiwaga, ang hiwaga ay ang ipinahayag ng Panginoon na sa bagong tipan ay magkasama na ang Hudyo at Hentil. Yan ang hiwaga na hindi nakita ng maraming mga Hudyo noon na sa kalooban ng Panginoon sa kaligtasan ay isama ang mga Hudyo at mga Hentil sa iisa na iglesia where it has broken down the walls of partition. The temple ay hinahati between Jews and there's a court for the Gentiles. And through Christ, He is saying, there is now one new humanity where the walls of partition are broken down so that Jews and Gentiles are now together. Yun ang hiwaga na ipinahayag sa bagong tipan. Yes, uh, Gino. Hello po, Pastor. Uh, cl clarify ko lang po. Tama po ba yung pagkakaintindi ko na yung sa covenant uh, classic reading ng Covenant of Grace is nag starting Covenant of Grace kay Adam and then nag-unfold siya yun nga, yung nagkaroon ng Mosaic Covenant, Davidic Covenants and then nung dumating si Christ yun na yung fulfillment niya yun, siya na yung culmination ng lahat ng Covenants, tama po ba? Yes, I mean, uh, but let me clarify when I say nagsimula I mean becoming operational the concept, the plan, the decree is eternity past. Uh, kaya may tinatawag na covenant of redemption among the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, how to redeem humanity conceived as sinners. And that's where the covenant of grace was conceived, where Christ will become the federal head of those he represented. Uh, but in operation, it began with Adam when he fell into sin. Okay. Uh, Follow-up ko lang po. Kasi yung 
Yung naging reading ko po, actually, hindi po ako kasi ako aware sa, hindi pa ako masyado nagbabasa about classical covenants and even federalist. Pero yung naging initial ko as I was reading through the scriptures is that uh, yung, uh, yung nangyari nung binigay nga ni God yung proto-evangelion kay, A- kay Adam, di ba? And then nung nag-unfold siya. Mystery para sa kanila, sa Jews, yung chosen people, yung covenant of grace. So they're only looking forward to Christ. And I saw na parang habang nagkakaroon nga po ng mga new covenants, yun nga yung unti-unting nare-reveal na uh, what will be of that covenant of grace. So parang ang nangyari, nung dumating po si Christ, parang ang nangyari, ang pagkaka-interpret ko po sa buong Old Testament is that they are promissory in a, in a way na parang pre-nomis ni God, di ba? Na meron darating na na Savior, which is si Jesus. And so, nung dumating si Jesus, dun parang na-reveal na merong covenant of grace na hindi lang na-reveal, parang dun nag-culminate na parang yung purpose pala lahat ng covenants na yun is to point towards Christ. And so, that is the parang covenant of grace. Iniisip ko po kasi, Pastor, kung may parallel siya sa, di ba po sa eschatology, we know that we are now citizens of it, of heaven through Christ, diba? by grace. So ngayon, we are looking forward to that. Pero, wala pa tayo dun. So we are, it's all, it's promissory. Pero hindi pa natin masasabi na we are already in heaven right now. Parang iniisip ko pa na applicable po ba yung logic na yun sa ano, yung aspect na yun. Yes, even today, we already have the realities, but not all. That's why we are called in a status of the already now and the not yet. We are still waiting for the consummation. The difference is, in our case, it has already begun. And we are waiting only for the fullness of the consummation. But we already have part of it. Uh, in the Old Testament, it's a promise. Uh, it's a promise that found fulfillment when Christ came. Kaya nga, when we deal with the uh, blessings and privileges of the Old Testament, we must not look at those as though they have the advantage over us. The reality is we have the advantage over them. This is the, fo- the wrong reading of Hebrews 11 that you often hear. You know, people say these are the heroes of faith. By faith, Abel did that blah, blah, blah. And by faith, Abraham. And then they say, uh, the message becomes, uh, do what they have done. They are examples to us. That's not what the writer of Hebrews says. Because by verse 40 of chapter 11, he says, they would not have been perfect or fulfilled without us. So, therefore, the message is they did those things by faith. We should do better because we have Christ. So, uh, we should find our blessings of salvation better than the Old Testament saints because they have it as promise. We have it as fulfillment. Uh, you see this in interpreting Romans 3, 24 to 26, just very briefly. Na sinabi, in the past, God has uh, exercised forbearance with the sins of, of the people of God in the past. But now, because of Christ, there is propitiation and God can be both just and the justifier of the one who believes in Jesus. Uh, let me paraphrase what he is saying. In the past, why did not God judge those people when they have sinned? Why did he not destroy Israel? Because Israel has often sinned. And the explanation is, he exercised forbearance. Nagtimpi. Hindi niya ibinuos ang kanyang puot. Nagtimpi siya. Pero pagdating kay Yesu Kristo, nagkaroon na ng pampalubag, propitiation. 
ang puot ng Diyos ay pinalubag sapagkat tinanggap ni Jesus ang puot ng Diyos. Eh, sa Old Testament, ceremonial lang yung mga sacrifices. In Christ, fulfillment, talagang na-propitiate, the wrath of God was removed so that now, in reality, the people of God are justified and God remains just. So, the advantage is that in the case of the Old Testament, they were not uh, in reality, uh, they did not have the kind of reality of salvation we have in the New Testament because in their case, it was promised God has exercised forbearance. In the New Testament, it is now reality because Christ has removed the wrath of God. So, ganyan natin tingnan yung advantage ng uh, nasa New Testament. Meron kasing nagtuturo na parang pareho lang ang Old Testament at New Testament. They were saved the same way. They had the same kind of salvation without realizing that in saying that, they are actually uh, diminishing the significance of the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is a turning point. Through the cross of Christ, the, that which was promised became fulfillment. And that should be of greater superiority than in the Old Testament. To illustrate that some of you, I'm sure, already heard from me, uh, pag merong place na nagkaroon ng calamity, uh, the government will promise relief. And then, the, uh, in order that people will not take advantage of that, who were not actually victims, so the barangay captain perhaps will give certification that this is a victim. So with that certification, the people who receive that certification would be happy because that's a promise of relief. But that's still different when the relief trucks begin arriving because now the reliefs are there. The Old Testament people who are truly saved had the promise, the certificate. When Christ came, the reliefs arrived. Uh, that's the difference ng promise and now in Christ fulfillment. Uh, Glenn. Hello. Hello po. Maki. Uh, I see. Baka dito po naka, nakatago. Pastor Noel, ako po si Maki, CRBC. Uh, uh, it seems to me, impression ko lang naman po ito, pero you likely touched on the on the on the interpretations ng mga 16, and federalists, no? Uh, it seems na may impact sa kanila how they uh, do hermeneutics. Tama po ba? Meron po bang impact sa kanila yung uh, how they interpret scripture and how they... Yes. And uh, since may may tama po yung yung how they do scripture should i be concerned na ana yung preacher should uh, as a lay person uh, sitting down on the ano uh, on the pew should i be concerned dun sa preacher whether he stands dun sa 1689 federalists because my impact on the application, I suppose. Yes, if they, if they will be consistent, but the fact is, and please don't take it wrongly, I mean this as a positive commendation of them. They are virtuously inconsistent. By that I mean, uh, if they are true to their position that the Old Testament is covenant of works, it will be difficult if you are consistent to say that grace is operative in the salvation of individuals in the Old Testament. But it is in their heart to really preach the gospel, even if they are preaching from the Old Testament. So they preach the gospel, and I commend them for that. But in so doing, they are virtuously inconsistent. The problem is, this is what I always tell my students, when it comes to error, the children are worse than the fathers. Mm 
What do I mean by that? The first generation error still possesses virtues that they cannot get away from because they were bred in the right way of preaching the gospel. The next generation will be the ones to push this to its logic. In fact, it is now beginning. The logic would be, among other things, deny the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments as binding. It's already begun. I'm not going to name names for now, but it has already begun. They are now saying that the Ten Commandments are no longer binding, which is a, a, a very bad interpretation for Christian conduct. Uh, thank you. So if the 1689 Federalists are going to live and die by their federalism uh, and, and they are committed to bring it to logical conclusions, so yun po yung uh, uh, nakikita po ninyo na pwedeng mangyari if they really want to be consistent all the way. Well, usually it to... happens by the second generation uh, recipients of the error. Yung mga unang nagturo maayos pa uh, because as I've said they have the breeding of being gospel preachers the next generation and I do not mean generation physically but the next recipients of teachings will be the ones to push to the logic their own premises and that's even worse thanks Pastor Roy Glenn uh, Pastor, I've once spoken with a brother who is a proponent of 1689 federalism. And one of the things that is being discredited, at least with his statement, is Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelium, Pastor. They're saying, or at least he is saying, that uh, this is not part, this is not at all covenant of grace, but rather it is merely a promise uh, it is merely a promise and if, uh, because there was no agreement between parties. There was a statement. There was actually, uh, yeah, there was actually a statement, a promise here on Ge Ge uh, Genesis 3.15. But there was no covenant at all, Pastor. How do you respond to that, Pastor? There's a pledge, a pledge <coughs> by God. And the basic element of a covenant is pledge. Uh, on whom is the pledge intended to be fulfilled and that will be all that the seed of the woman will represent and that is all the people of God and therefore uh, the statement read barely may simply be a statement of promise of uh, final victory for the seed of the woman against Satan uh, but read as a pledge by God, you, have, you need to ask on whom will this be intended to be fulfilled? And is the pledge something that was a, 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 a statement of the moment or is it according to the plan of redemption? Well, I believe that it is part of the history of redemption and the history of redemption is history of covenants. as a statement of the covenant of grace that began with Adam. And that has been the traditional reading uh, from all sides of Reformed theology. Okay, let's close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us in seeking to study what your word teaches concerning the covenant and as it is expressed in our Confession of Faith, the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. And we pray that we may be clarified in our understanding and understanding that you have dealt with sinners from the very beginning of Adam's federal headship when he fell into sin. You have dealt with him by way of grace. And that grace, beginning with Adam, has unfolded in the Old Testament in various covenants, and all these covenants are
developments of the covenant of grace until it finds complete fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. And even in that fulfillment, we have what is already now, and we are waiting for the not yet, but because of Christ, all those blessings of salvation are now guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. So we ask, Lord, that we may see the implication of this in our own reading of the scriptures and for those who teach and preach to see the implication of preaching the gospel of grace even when preaching from the Old Testament. And we have the uh, basis for that because we find the covenant of grace in all of the Old Testament. Grace indeed has shown itself greater where sin abounds. And may this be our conviction and our confession as a church and as the people of God. And we pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>